G, Charles II, uh, in his coronation outfit, very nice, very dapper fellow, uh, known as the Merry Monarch, in case you're interested in English history. In 1663, he made a land grant for uh, Carolina. That's what it looks like. It's very pretty, isn't it? Um, Carolina comes from the Latin Carolinus, meaning of Charles. And he gave the land to eight of his friends who helped him uh, regain the English throne. You perhaps remember uh, his father lost his head and was followed by a period of rule by uh, Cromwell. And then Charles II was restored eventually to the English throne. The grant included all the land in the North American continent between the latitudes 31 and 36 degrees north, all the way to the Pacific. So that's why it included Tennessee. It included a lot of things, and most of which he didn't really own the grant, but anyway. In uh, 1729, the proprietors, the, the people who he, uh, he gave it to, sold their shares back to the crown in North and South Carolina, were then separated. The part that became Tennessee was part of North Carolina. In, uh, in December of 1776, remember that was a big year over here in the colonies, uh, North Carolina wrote its own constitution. Why did it do that? Well, uh, in, uh, in May, the Continental Congress uh, passed a resolution to urge all the states to, or colonies to abandon their uh, charters and write their own constitutions. Uh, that was done pursuant to resolution of John Adams, who uh, until he died maintained that that was the real Declaration of Independence, not that thing that uh, Jefferson wrote a couple of months later. Uh, like all the early state constitutions, North Carolina's really focused on the abuse of power of colonial governors. The colonial governors were the representatives of the crown uh, in, in uh, the colonies, and they exercised a lot of power and, in the view of the colonists, abused a lot of that power. So when they wrote their, their initial constitutions in each, each state, they, uh, they drastically cut back on the powers of the, the governor and increased the powers of the legislature. Uh, the North Carolina Constitution, of course, didn't spring out of the minds of the, totally of the people in meeting in North Carolina in, in December of, of 76. Uh, they drew on the constitutions of Virginia and Pennsylvania, Delaware and New Jersey, uh, in addition to uh, John Adams' pamphlet Thoughts on government. Uh, he uh, he was very influential in uh, the early uh, colonial constitutions. So we move on to 1783. The Treaty of Paris ends the American Revolution. It established the western boundary of the U.S. as the middle of the Mississippi River. So that that was the boundary of North Carolina. Um, in, uh, let's see, okay, in 1789, the Cumberland uh, uh, counties, the ones around here, uh, voted to petition North Carolina to uh, secede their lands in the West, which the West was here. Uh, to the U.S. and in 1790, North Carolina did. And the U.S. accepted it and formed the territory of the United States south of the Ohio River. William Blunt was appointed the governor. Anybody here related to William Blunt? Good. <laughs> Because I believe history is warts and all. And I'm going to talk about William Blunt for a minute. Obviously, 
He's the founding father of Tennessee, and he was very important. Blunt was a huge land speculator. He and his brothers owned over a million acres of Western land. Now, he wasn't the only one of, of these folks who speculated in land. Jackson did it. You know, George Washington had a lot of land in Ohio. Uh, Jefferson had some land. All those guys speculated in land, but Blunt took it to another level. One biographer said Blunt was a businessman in politics for business. Another pair of historians, uh, the Collier brothers, who wrote a book called Decision in Philadelphia, said his sole interest in serving in the North Carolina State Legislature, in Congress, and as governor of the Southwest Territory was to see that matters were arranged to advance his own interests. Pretty harsh, right? If you think that was harsh, get this. <laughs> the Colliers further wrote, Blunt was a curious figure to find in the company of the noble Washington, the honorable Madison, and the sensible Sherman. He was a liar, a cheater, and a thief, and was subject to the first impeachment trial ever held by the U.S. government. He had no interest in fame or status. He was a man motivated solely by the love of money. Wow, uh, this is, this is our, our founding father of the state. Uh, he, uh, he served in the U.S. Constitutional Convention, but only because North Carolina was so cheap that they just told their congressman to go ahead and go over to Philadelphia from New York and, and, and participate in the convention. Uh, he, he arrived late at the Constitutional Convention, you know, it began in May, he arrived June 20th, and he left July 1st. He, uh, he left to go back to Congress because uh, they were having some uh, important debates about uh, the Jay Treaty with Spain, which uh, would have cut off access to New Orleans on the Mississippi, and they were about to vote on the Northwest Ordinance. He did return to the Constitutional Convention eventually, um, and he signed it. He expressly signed it. Uh, he expressly said when he signed it that he didn't sign it to approve it, but to test a test to its authenticity. So he's kind of like, uh, if you're familiar with the, the play Hamilton that's on Broadway now, he's kind of like uh, Aaron Burr, you know, uh, smile more, talk less. He, 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 People who knew him loved him. He was supposed to be a great guy. Uh, but according to one of the other delegates to the Constitutional Convention, he had none of those talents that make men shine. <laughs> Walter Durham, in his book on the Southwest Territory, observed that uh, in a letter to a friend, John Steele, dated July 7, 1790, Blunt said his presence in the Western country would secure his land holdings and increase their value. That was right after he'd been appointed governor. Uh, it was known that he advised partners to buy land using fictitious names when uh, the law limited the amount a person could buy. And he did everything. Um, nevertheless, he had lots of support for the position of governor in the Southwest Territory. And Washington appointed him in June of 1790. Uh, just as a postscript, after uh, we became a state, he was chosen to be a U.S. Senator in, uh, on August 2nd, 1796, and he was expelled from the Senate July 8th, 1797. <laughs> so he served 11 months in the Senate. Uh, he was expelled for his involvement in a scheme to transfer control of Spanish Florida and Louisiana to Great Britain uh, because he thought it would uh, make his land holdings more valuable. So, interesting fellow, uh, and uh, uh, I don't point that out to, to denigrate him. I just point it out to say that these people were not, uh, were not all angels and uh, 
uh, they had, they had, sometimes they had their own deals going. In fact, after the first Constitutional Convention, there's a letter from Blunt to a, uh, another delegate where he says, uh, remember during the convention, I talked to you about representing Andrew Jackson and selling some land to you on the Duck River. And they, they discuss it and eventually that, that deal is, is consummated. Uh, so even during the convention, Blunt was working deals, working land deals. So in, uh, in 1795, Blunt and the territorial legislature authorized a census to determine the population to see if there was enough to seek statehood. The Northwest Ordinance was used as a guide for Tennessee to become a state. And that's because the North Carolina Act ceding uh, the land that eventually became Tennessee to the U.S. Um, said, we want this area to become a state eventually pursuant to the Northwest Ordinance. And the, uh, the U.S. Uh, government agreed to that. So uh, the census showed over 60,000 people. A referendum was held, and the majority uh, favored statehood. Uh, now, use this handy dandy little red dot. I'm glad my cat's not here. Uh, this is this is the the Cumberland settlements, the three counties in what we think of as Middle Tennessee now, and here's the. The eastern counties, there were eight of those. And uh, they were, there were a lot more people over here than over here. And in the middle, there was wilderness. Down here was, was uh, Native American territory. Over here was, this is, this is all, all unsettled area. Uh, the, uh, the eastern counties favored statehood by a large majority and the, uh, the other counties, what I think of as the middle, but really they were Western then, uh, didn't favor it because they thought the East would dominate state government because it was more populous. And they were right. The East did dominate state government. Uh, there were lots of, of kind of mixed feelings between the two areas for a long time. They were you know, very separated. There's 200 miles of wilderness there that that you didn't dare cross by yourself. There were bandits and, and uh, rogue uh, Native Americans and all kinds of people that you didn't want to run into uh, in those areas. And so you traveled in, in large groups. Uh, in fact, some of the people in, in, in these settlements in, around here uh, uh, didn't like a lot of the people over here because the, uh, the Indians, and I, I I should say Native Americans, I suppose. The, they would steal horses over here and take them over here and sell them. And uh, supposedly people in the East kind of knew where they were coming from, but you know, they got good deals. So Each of the 11 counties elected five delegates to the convention. Now, rather than being centered around political parties, uh, Tennessee at this time was centered around, around two factions, one led by Blunt, the other led by John Sevier. When their mutual interests coincided, they could manage to work together. And at this point in time, they did. They both favored statehood. Blunt wanted to be a senator. Uh, everybody knew Sevier was going to be governor. It was kind of a given. Uh, as territorial governor, Blunt appointed many of the future delegates to local positions. Uh, so uh, over half the delegates had some sort of obligation to Blunt uh, past in the past. And, uh, and uh, so he kind of, he kind of ran it. Uh, Severe was not a member, but according to his journal, he arrived in Knoxville the day before the convention started, and he left three days after it ended. So he kept an eye on it. And his son actually uh, was a, uh, a clerk there at the convention. 
So the delegates met in, in Knoxville, January 1796. They met at the, the office of David Hendley, who was an agent for the U.S. War Department. The, uh, the office was located on the corner of Church and Gay Streets. Next time you're in Knoxville, take a look. It's where that parking lot is now. Yes. Um, some of the 55 members are famous. You've got Andrew Jackson, you've got James Robertson, you've got William Blunt. 17 members have counties named after them. 16 of the members came from Virginia, eight from Pennsylvania, and seven from North Carolina. And various members had served in the Watauga Association, the Consti North Carolina Constitutional Convention, and of course, Blunt visited the uh, U.S. Constitutional Convention. Uh, Blunt was chosen president, surprise, surprise, of the convention, and it, it only met for 27 days. Uh, why? It was said that the, the delegates uh, were all friendly and worked together and were happy um, and very harmonious. Uh, well, you know, they copied it. They copied the Constitution. A lot of it came from North Carolina, and a lot of it came from the 1790 Constitution of Pennsylvania. Um, it was not put to a vote of the people. Why not? Well, uh, it, was, it was written by people who were elected to write it, and the view then was, you know, you elected them to do it, they did it, so here it is. Uh, later on, of course, we, we, we take the view that the people should, uh, should approve them. Now, there's a preamble to the Constitution that uh, asserts the right to, uh, to admission to the Union. The, uh, the legislature had, was to have two houses. They debated that for three days. Why did that take three days? I don't know. Every, every other state had two houses. Now, Pennsylvania had had one house from 1776 to 1790, and then they even moved to two. So I don't know why there was such a debate. The legislature met every other year in the fall, which I think would be a good idea if we still did that. <laughs> Uh, the legislature appointed the judges, the state's attorneys, the treasurers, plural. You could have more than one treasurer. And the Constitution still says you, the legislature appoints the treasurer or treasurers for the state. And at one time, there was a treasurer for, for uh, there were two. There was one for the West and, and one for the rest of the state. They also appointed the Secretary of State and all the local officials. Of course, there was a land holding uh, requirement. You had to own 200 lake, uh, acres to be, uh, to be uh, uh, in the legislature. The governor, the governor uh, was weak. It's just like the North Carolina Constitution in that sense. They brought that forward. Um, a two-year term, no more than six out of every eight years in office. No veto. He was commander-in-chief of the Army and Navy and militia. Uh, to my knowledge, we've not had a Navy, but it's, it is still in the Constitution. In 1870, they debated on that very point, and someone said, well, we have navigable rivers. We might have a Navy sometime. And they said, okay, we'll leave it in. Uh, the, uh, the judiciary uh, wasn't much. Uh, there was almost nothing said about the judiciary in the first constitution uh, other than the legislature uh, was to establish all the courts and the judge, uh, the legislature appointed the judges. Now, there's a Declaration of Rights, sort of like the Bill of Rights. In fact, it, there's a lot of stuff in the Declaration of Rights that's, uh, that's similar to the Bill of Rights. Uh, had standard prov provisions on, you know, trial by jury, search and seizure, no double jeopardy, no ex post facto, et cetera. 
there's, a, there's an interesting provision about the right of equal participation of the free navigation of the Mississippi River cannot be ceded to any prince, potentate, power, or person. We still have that in the Constitution. And remember I said William Blunt left the Constitutional Convention to go back to Congress to participate in the debate on the Jay Treaty with Spain. Now, the, the Jay Treaty with Spain, had it gone into effect, would have ceded um, navigation of the Mississippi River uh, exclusively to Spain for 25 years. The South hated it. Of course, out in the West, you know, the, the Mississippi River was the way to get your, your grain or whatever uh, to, to the world. Um, the, uh, the Jay Treaty never went into effect. It was never approved. However, uh, Spain unilaterally closed the lower Mississippi to American shipping for many, many years. They did it uh, in 1784. And um, the Mississippi River was opened again by the Treaty of San Lorenzo that was signed in, in October of 1795 and ratified in April of 1796. So when this constitutional provision was written, we still didn't, weren't able to navigate in the lower Mississippi River. So this was important. And uh, supposedly Blunt is behind this. And when you think about him leaving the Constitutional Convention to go deal with this in Congress, you can see he must have viewed it as very important. Uh, the right of preemption to certain settlers in areas of East Tennessee, there was a debate uh, about exactly where the lines were with Virginia. And some people may have been uh, settled in areas that, like, that they couldn't settle in. And, and so uh, uh, that was to, to try and help them out. There's uh, the doctrine of non-resistance was condemned. Uh, you know, that's another colonial uh, thing that, uh, that they brought forward. The doctrine of non-resistance uh, said that, you know, kings were, were, appoint were designated by God. And so if you, if you opposed a king, you committed a sin. So that was the doctrine of non-resistance. And, and they, they condemned that even though we hadn't been under a king for, you know, several years. Ministers were not allowed to serve in the legislature. Um, and um, there was no religious test for office. I don't know. Um, voting every freeman, age 21, who owned, owned some land and had been in the, in the county for six months could vote. So not only white males, of course this is males, oh, not only white males, but black males could vote. Knoxville was declared the seat of government. And as I said earlier, no popular vote was taken. The document was delivered to Washington. Uh, there was a debate on whether to allow Tennessee to, uh, to join the Union or not. Uh, Tennessee uh, was, uh, well, the Federalists in Congress were afraid that Tennessee was going to not vote for them. Remember, this is 1796. Washington has announced He's not going to be a candidate for president again. So you're going to have Adams and you're going to have Jefferson. And the Federalists who uh, uh, in Congress were afraid that Tennesseans would vote for Jefferson. Um, and ultimately, they were right. Uh, but uh, they held it up for a while. And ultimately, the deal that was struck gave gave Tennessee temporarily one less congressman and therefore one less electoral vote um, in the next, uh, through the next election. But it all worked out and the act admitting Tennessee as a state was signed June 1st. 
1796 by President George Washington, uh, which is, is why we're here today. Late in February, Andrew Jackson reported to Blunt that the people generally approved of the Constitution. And you see some of the signatories here. I won't, uh, I won't go into, into trying to read, read all their uh, names. So you see Andrew Jackson, James Robertson, John McNary, Joseph Anderson, a lot, James White, Archibald Rome, a lot of names. If you, if you study any Tennessee history, those names, those names are familiar. Jefferson was said to have called the Tennessee Constitution the least imperfect and most Republican of any state constitution. Uh, there's no real proof that he said that, however. Um, it was consistent with the the state constitutions that had come prior to Tennessee's in that it enhanced legislative authority and diminished the authority of the governor. Remember, I talked about the experience with colonial governors. That carried through when Tennessee was copying the 1796 Constitution of North Carolina. That carried through. Okay, Tennessee in the mid-1830s look different. Remember earlier we had in 1796 we had these counties here and these over here. Well we've got counties everywhere now. This area was opened up in, in uh, 1819. This area was also been heavily settled. Uh, so Tennessee is, is a much more populous uh, thriving state. Uh, the Constitutional Convention uh, met in 1834. Some of the delegates included Wiley Blunt, who was former governor and brother of, of, uh, of Mr. Blunt, who was uh, William Blunt. Francis Fogg, Hume Fogg School. Adam Huntsman, peg leg Adam Huntsman. That's what he was called. He, uh, he eventually defeated Davy Crockett for Congress, so he was the guy who prompted Congress to tell his constituents, you can go to hell, I'm going to Texas. West Humphreys, a future uh, attorney general and federal district judge. Uh, he also was a Confederate federal district judge, and he, he was impeached by Congress because he, he took the Confederate job and Robert McKinney, who was a future justice. This is Francis Fogg and Adam Huntsman. Um, I think I found a picture of his peg leg, but I couldn't verify it, so I didn't include it. <laughs> Why have another constitutional convention? Well, taxation, particularly land. The first Constitution of Tennessee um, was favorable to people who speculated in land. <laughs> Surprise, right? Um, the taxation of land was, was really based on acreage. And so if you had a lot of land, you're, you're, you paid based on 100 acres. And that 100 acres could be in the middle of a town, or it could be a swamp, and it was taxed the same. Uh, so um, that, that was considered a problem, and uh, let's see what's next, okay. Uh, let, me, let me keep talking about the taxation for a minute. Um, so what did they do to remedy the taxation problem? They, um, they taxed land according to its value. That's what we still do. We may do it a little differently, but the basic concept remains the same. Next problem, judiciary. Tennessee's judiciary was viewed as inefficient. Uh, one report written by the Tennessee Senate 
called it the most expensive and least efficient in the U.S. The uh, judiciary also lacked independence. Uh, in 1809, actually, the, the Supreme Court was abolished and reconstituted. Remember, the legislature established all the courts under the first constitution. So what they can establish, they can abolish. So um, in 1831, the Supreme Court wrote three opinions that said the legislature had uh, violated the Constitution in, in, uh, in enacting some laws. They did not take that well. <laughs> there was a very strong movement to abolish the Tennessee Supreme Court and create a new one that thought a little more like the legislature did. It didn't happen, but it got a lot of people to thinking. Uh, there was also a lot of, of tinkering with the, with the, the court system and um, too much travel for the judges. John Overton retired in 1816 from the court, Supreme Court, and in his letter, he wrote to the governor that he had, he had traveled 1,500 miles by horse in the last year. Uh, I think even then that was pretty rough, and now we would think that's just horrific. You could get the Supreme, if you could get you know, enough votes in the legislature, you could get the, the Supreme Court to meet in your town. So they were going all over the state. And allegedly, uh, all that travel killed two of the justices. Solutions to all these problems. Number one is, they wrote the Supreme Court into the Constitution, so it could never be abolished. They, uh, they wrote a provision that said you can't increase or diminish a judge's salary during his term. So what does that mean? You can't punish, a, the legislature couldn't punish a judge because uh, of a decision the judge wrote or couldn't reward a judge for a decision the judge wrote. They limited the Supreme Court to meeting in one place per grand division. It helped a lot. The legislature named those places Knoxville, Nashville, and Jackson. Why Jackson and not Memphis? Well, Jackson was, was in, in the 1830s was sort of was more central in the West than, than Memphis, and it wasn't clear that Memphis was going to be the big, the big town it, it eventually became. They also inserted a separation of powers provision into the Constitution, uh, which, which helps delineate uh, that uh, each branch of government can't be interfering with the others. Next problem, legislative power. Okay, this comes back to early state constitutions, right? The legislature gets all this power. And even a legislature composed of representatives of the people, uh, when it's given too much power, it can be abused. Uh, for one thing, they were enacting too many private acts. There were things like, uh, let's see, I don't know how this, how this goes. Okay, revised taxation, Supreme Court. One thing is they, they uh, they provided that local officials would be elected rather than appointed by the legislature. Another, the legislature couldn't grant divorces anymore. They were spending a lot of time granting divorces. People would petition the legislature for an act letting them divorce. So this says no more legislative divorces. It's all done pursuant to law in the courts. Couldn't authorize lotteries either. Uh, there were a lot of private lotteries being authorized by the legislature. A lot of them were kind of crooked. Uh, and uh, so they just said, okay, no more. And you know, that's the way it was until after the Tennessee Supreme Court said bingo was a lottery. And then all of a sudden, we changed that constitution. 
to allow charitable lotteries and to allow um, a, lot, a state lottery uh, for education purposes, of course. The vote was limited to free white males. No longer could free uh, African Americans vote. They required selection of a permanent capital. The capital of Tennessee had bounced around like a ping pong ball. And uh, they decided, okay, by 1843, the legislature has to name a permanent capital. So of course, the legislature waited until 1843 and named Nashville where the capital was. Uh, as Tennessee's permanent capital. There's a few more things I'll mention before we, we move on. Um, other convention actions, they removed property qualifications for voting. Very populist, Jacksonian kind of thing. Um, they rejected emancipation. They established a school fund. The legislature was allowed to tax merchants, peddlers, and privileges. Really opened up what you could tax. Previously, basically, it was land. The legislature was to encourage internal improvements. That was a long debate. You know, some, some folks felt like that was not the place of government to, uh, you know, encourage canals and railroads and you know, roads. They disqualified uh, you for office if you participated in a duel. When, uh, when my wife was uh, sworn in as an assistant DA, she came home and said, I had to promise not to carry a charge. What does that mean? <laughs> so, yeah. So, you know, that was part of the dueling deal. Um, I've never dueled you. No, you, 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 you upheld that, and, and we were proud of you for that. <laughs> Newspaper commentaries generally praised the uh, proposed changes. The Constitution was approved by a vote of the people in 1835. The vote was 42,644 to 17,091. Uh, um, only a little over half the voters voted. Sounds like today. Uh, one newspaper, if half the people voted now, we'd say this is great, right? <laughs> the newspaper uh, reported that half the people voted, citing great indifference to the subject. So, no radical changes were made, but the changes reflected a maturing commercial society. Newton Cannon called it the same old constitution, revised and amended. Um, so what we have here is an example of the second wave of state constitutions. They cut back on legislative dominance of the government. They gave it an increased role to other branches. 1853 was a, uh, was a change. There were two amendments to the Constitution uh, to provide for the election of judges and election for the attorneys for the state. So that was approved in, in August of 1853, and the first vote for those folks were, was the next year, in 54. Now, in 1865, there were some amendments. Um, in my notes, I put 1865 convention in quotation marks, because it wasn't your traditional constitutional convention. Um, the East Tennessee uh, Unionists called for a convention to meet in December of 64. That's 1864 to take steps to restore Tennessee to the Union. Remember, November 
Just before that, Andrew Johnson, military governor of Tennessee, had been elected vice president. An ideal time to try and restore Tennessee to the Union, because most of Tennessee was already uh, in Union hands anyway. But they couldn't meet in December of 64 because of a little thing called the Battle of Nashville. So it was put off till, till January of 65, and over 500 delegates, that is anybody who wanted to show up, assembled in Nashville, including William Brownlow, DeWitt Center, and uh, Horace Maynard. Many of the delegates thought they were there to nominate candidates for a constitutional convention. Andrew Johnson recommended, however, that the group go ahead and just be a constitutional convention. <laughs> Many of the delegates thought that was wrong and left, leaving the delegates who thought that was fine to go ahead and do what they wanted to do. So, of course, the convention proposed an amendment abolishing slavery, an amendment forbidding the legislature from making any law recognizing the property in man. Now, there was a schedule to these amendments that did even more. Declared the Secession Act unconstitutional and void. Declared the acts of state government since May 6th, 1861 void. Ratified everything Andrew Johnson did. Disfranchised ex-Confederates and sympathizers and set a vote on the amendments for February 4. And, you know, we'll go ahead and assume they'll be approved and set a date for elections for governor and the legislature, too. Now, the vote was, was held, and um, the voting was light. Uh, people who, who weren't disenfranchised but still opposed this road convention uh, stayed away from the polls. But after the polls closed, uh, ratification of the amendments was celebrated by firing a hundred cannons on the Capitol grounds. Supposedly it shook every building in downtown Nashville. Um, the governor, Governor Johnson had to leave for Washington. You know, he's going to be VP, so he had to leave. So he went ahead and declared the amendments ratified before all the results were in. Um, the ballots for rat said you wrote for you wrote the words ratification or rejection, and uh, you, the name of the voter the voter had to write their name on the back of the va ballot. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> Um, the vote, the vote, you, you also had to take an oath, a loyalty oath to vote. So they got about a little over 10% of the population or the voting population voted, and that was enough under Lincoln's proclamation of December of 1863 that if a tenth of the voters who voted in the 1860 uh, election took the loyalty oath, uh, the state could uh, could reestablish their government. So um, Johnson, on February twenty fifth, declared the amendments ratified. The total results were were pretty impressive. Uh, you know, twenty five thousand two hundred ninety three for and forty eight against. Forty eight people who were, <laughs> were willing to write their name on the back of the ballot to to say they opposed it. Subsequently, Brownlow was elected governor and the new legislature was dominated by what historians seem to call radicals. And we get to the Constitution of 1870. It's held at the Davidson County Courthouse and probably the leading delegate was Alfred Osborne Pope Nicholson. He uh, he was a lawyer, a newspaper editor, a former U.S. Senator, and future Tennessee Supreme Court Chief Justice. So just before 
1870, Brownlow went to the Senate, ex-Confederates regained their, uh, their right to vote. A convention was called, met in the Davidson County Courthouse in January of 1870. Half the delegates were attorneys. I don't know if that's a good thing or a bad thing. Um, half had held legislative or judicial offices. I mentioned Nicholson. Um, was also people like Joseph High School, who later became Attorney General, John C. Brown, who later became uh, the governor, uh, Neil Brown, who was a former governor, David Por uh, James D. Porter, who was a former gov future governor. John C. Brown uh, was elected president of the convention. And he said, we cannot, we must not be unmindful of the great changes that have impressed themselves upon our history. Let us accept the situation and not seek to alter circumstances which have passed beyond our control. Nicholson also urged, let's be careful. Let's do no more than is absolutely necessary. All the while, there were, there were people who sought to stop or nullify the convention. East Tennessee Congressman Horace Maynard presented a petition to the U.S. House asking Congress to restrain the illegal and revolutionary proceedings in Nashville. Uh, the Memphis Daily Appeal reported that another reconstruction of the state is seriously threatened. Uh, the Tennessee Secretary of State Fletcher wrote a letter to Congress saying Tennessee was a seething volcano. <laughs> So nothing ever happened to that. Many of the convention's act, uh, actions did address activities of the Brownlow administration in the aftermath of the Civil War. Some of the changes they, they put in were no political tests for office. There was also a condemnation of martial law. Brownlow used martial law I hate to use the term liberally, but that's what he did. Um, it required the governor to state reasons for special sessions. The governor could call a special session, and before this, before this, the uh, the uh, legislature could come into session and do whatever they wanted, stay as long as they wanted. Well, the the new constitutional provision said the, the governor had to state the reasons they were being called into special session and they couldn't do anything that wasn't related to those reasons. There was another, uh, another uh, provision that required safe and comfortable prisons. Why would you do that? Well, remember, this convention was composed of ex-Confederates to a large degree who had been in prisons, and uh, apparently the conditions weren't that great, and they thought Tennessee should do better, so they required safe and comfortable prisons. Um, many years later, just a, uh, 15 years or so ago, Tennessee adopted an amendment to drop the word comfortable. So now we just have to have safe prisons. They're not, they're not comfortable anymore. I don't think anybody who's been in prison would describe it as comfortable anyway. They amended the right to bear arms to clarify that the legislature had the power to regulate arms to prevent crime. They limited legislative pay to 75 days. Previously, the uh, legislature under Brownlow met for over 700 days. We had to pay them for every day they were there. Um, they hit, you know, Tennessee had more Civil War battles than any other state but Virginia, right? Well, what, what happens when you have these battles? You, you have disruption of supply lines, right? You try and cut the supply lines of your opponent. Well, the supply lines were basically railroads and 
Tennessee's railroads were in dismal shape by the, the end uh, of the war. So uh, companies formed to, uh, to build new railroads. Now, how did companies raise money? One way is selling stock, just like today. And so they sold stock, and, and the state of Tennessee wanting to encourage the building of these railroads because you need infrastructure uh, to transport goods, create jobs, etc. So the state of Tennessee bought a lot of, of railroad stock and issued a lot of bonds for the benefit of railroads. And uh, it, it, it didn't work out very well. The railroads, um, a lot of them uh, went belly up uh, or weren't able to pay the state back. So in, in 1867 and 68, the state of Tennessee defaulted on, uh, on its railroad bonds. And uh, by 1869, the state debt related to railroads was $35 million. Now, think about it. 1869, $35 million. Well, I went to Google the other day and asked Google how much money $35 million in uh, 1869 would be today. And the answer is... Uh, $657 million. So the state of Tennessee was, was really, really in debt. So uh, due to these bonds and stocks. So the 1870 convention prohibited the state from owning stock or lending its credit to private entities. Where's your answer? Uh, taxing language uh, was changed a little bit. Uh, according to uh, Nicholson, to uh, reduce the exceptions that the legislature had previously created. Um, universal male suffrage comes to Tennessee. Notice I said male. Uh, suffrage was subject to age, residency, and a poll tax. And uh, you couldn't vote if you committed an infamous crime which was basically a felony. Poll tax revenues were dedicated to education. There was a common school fund that had been created uh, by the prior constitution, uh, but the failure of the Bank of Tennessee in 1866 wiped it out. So uh, uh, they, uh, they created a poll tax to uh, reestablish an education fund. Uh, county offices were to be filled by uh, election or by the county court. That was to stop uh, people. Uh, apparently, there had been a lot of appointees by Governor Brownlow to, to local offices that the locals didn't care for. So that was to end the government being able to do that. They increased the number of judges on the Supreme Court to five permanently and added a sixth to ha help handle the backlog caused by the war. Uh, you know, courts didn't meet during the war, and there were a lot of cases uh, to be heard. So the Supreme Court, while it was six, um, divided into uh, two panels of three to hear cases to cut the backlog down. Uh, it helped some, but it never really got it wiped out. Um, the Supreme Court was to appoint the Attorney General and Reporter, and the Supreme Court was to meet in Nashville, Jackson, and Knoxville. Remember, uh, the Const prior Constitution said they meet in one place in each general in each uh, grand division, and the legislature named Nashville, Knoxville, and Jackson. So they just put that in the Constitution this time. They gave the governor a veto. Whoa, how about that? Um, really, really that, that beefs up the governor's powers quite a bit. They enacted what's called the single subject rule. That means each bill has to be about a single subject. 
That could be a big, broad subject or a little narrow subject. Why do I bring that out? Because that's a really good thing. Congress doesn't have a single subject rule. So you have military appropriation bills that have stuff about social security in it. And, and you know, it keeps, uh, Nicholson called it uh, preventing incongruous and independent subjects being in one act. Uh, I think that that's really a good thing to have. There was a provision added that said no voting on a U.S. constitutional amendment by the legislature unless that legislature was elected after the submission of the amendment. The theory being uh, the, the amendment becomes a, a topic of the election and the people vote, uh, at least in part, based on the views of that amendment. That became important, that became important for the 19th Amendment women's suffrage because that didn't happen when we voted on the women's suffrage amendment. But the, the Attorney General has, uh, uh, Thompson wrote an opinion that said, you can't infringe on the U.S. Constitution's uh, statements about how, how uh, a constitutional amendment is approved. And the U.S. Constitution didn't say anything about that. So uh, he said this law uh, couldn't be, this provision couldn't be enforced. Um, winding this up a little bit, the, the Constitution, uh, the convention did take time to have a little fun. The members went to pay their respects to Mrs. Polk and to Mrs. Catron. John Catron had been a uh, Supreme Court justice. And it was a tradition, every legislature went to visit Mrs. Polk. Uh, and pay their respects to, to the, the widow of President Polk. There was also a big banquet hosted by Nashville's merchants at the Maxwell House the night before they were supposed to take up the tax provisions. I'm sure it was just a coincidence of timing. Uh, the delegates signed the proposed uh, Constitution on February 23rd. 1870, except several delegates identified by the newspapers as radicals refused to sign it. It was approved by the people by a vote of 98,000 to 33,000, basically, and it was declared ratified May 5th, 1870. It's been said that the 1870 convention was a, a political expedient to restore citizenship to the majority of the white voters and to show acceptance of the results of the Civil War. I think, I think that's true, but it's more. The convention did a lot more than that. These people were intelligent, experienced men, and they systematically went through the entire document and made adjustments as experience and common sense dictated. Uh, I think it's time for me to stop now. My goal was to talk about the three constitutions that are downstairs. Thank you very much. Uh, I enjoyed it and, and uh, appreciate it.